This yeah. conference will now be recorded. Um, well, welcome everybody and thank you for joining in. Um, I, uh, my name is Marek and uh, hopefully I will be presenting. Okay, we do normal. Ah, here we go. My name is Marek. And uh, today I would like to tell you about what has happened when uh, my colleagues and I uh, decided uh, that it would be a great idea to build an asphalt concrete track bed layer on one of our uh, main lines in uh, the Czech Republic. So uh, we published all our findings in, uh, in a paper uh, uh, here which uh, was published earlier this year, and it contains uh, much more details than uh, we, uh, I'm able to present today to you because of the time constraints. So if you become interested, I invite you all to download the paper and read paper. It contains uh, many more information. Lastly, before we start, I would like to thank the PWI Birmingham section for giving me this opportunity to actually present to you today. So I thought I'll just uh, briefly show my face and now I'm going to uh, close uh, off my camera because to save some bandwidth. Now, uh, when I talk about us or we or, or, or you know, ours, uh, the fact is that this research is a collaboration and it's a <clears throat> it's a really a collaboration between a collective of authors so we have dr kuchera and dr lidmila from czech technical university in prague an absolutely crucial person was uh, mr jasanski who's the system engineering specialist in uh, uh, Sprava Železnic, which is effectively a uh, network rail of Czechia. Uh, so it's a railway infrastructure manager in, in Czechia. And this is me, uh, I'm your presenting author today. And because I'm PhD at the university, I also have two supervisors. So I have uh, uh, Dr. Burrow and Dr. Gatora as, as supervisors. Hmm. As supervisors. Now, uh, what are we going to talk about? So, first of all, I assume that uh, not many of you are familiar with asphalt and asphalt concrete and all the reclaimed asphalt and all that kind of stuff. So, we'll have a quick, uh, quick uh, section of background. Then uh, I'm going to talk about what we are here all about today, uh, which is our trial section in Šťáhlavy in Czechia. And if there is some time left at the end, uh, then hopefully we will have some discussion about how what we discovered in Šťáhlavy might be relevant to the UK. There are likely to be uh, two intermezzos uh, in the presentation. One is a loss of signal that has happened on any on every presentation I've been online since, so it's very likely it's going to happen today as well. And a second intermezzo is probably my voice disappearing because I'm st still trying to get over some nasty cold, but uh, we will see about that. So let's go into background. Uh, throughout the presentation, I will be talk. I will be saying sentences like, "We design asphalt concrete mixture containing 70% of reclaimed asphalt," and you might not understand what I mean. So let's do word by word. So first, uh, what is asphalt, or something called bitumen, and it is a sticky, black, and highly viscous liquid or semi-solid form of petroleum. So on the picture here on the left hand side, you can see you can see a bitumen, a, a, a bitumen ash, uh, natural bitumen, which can be found in ponds like that. And we've been using a, a natural asphalt for millennia, you know, to making like a ships waterproof and whatever. But we also can make it man-made. So we take oil, we 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 refine it. And in, in refinery, here is a petrol from, you know, here is diesel, and down there you can see there's asphalt. So we can also make it man made. And when we make it man made, uh, it has one important feature for us. During ambient temperature, which is somewhere between minus 10 to plus 30, it is actually solid. So it looks like on the 
uh, on, on 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 the picture here but when we heat it and by no not much you know somewhere to 150 to 200 uh, degrees of celsius it actually becomes liquid and that's very beneficial to us we can use it and we do use it and uh, most how we use it in civil engineering in, is in something we call asphalt concrete and asphalt concrete is uh, actually you know it is what it says it is so it is concrete with asphalt in it so in normal concrete which you can see on a uh, on a on a picture here uh, you have uh, the crushed aggregate grains which are the big ones and then in between is a cement and then the cement reacts with water and produce a chemical reaction hardens keeps the the the, the crushed aggregate grains in place and creates a concrete and uh, in asphalt concrete, you can see the same thing. So we have the crushed aggregate grains here in gray, and around there is this black thing that's asphalt. But instead of adding water, we just use temperature, you know. So we heat the asphalt up, it becomes liquid, it wraps around the grains, we put it in formworks and let it cool down, it hardens, and we have asphalt concrete. And most of asphalt concrete is actually actually used in in roads over 70 percent and we all know that we use roads to drive around and for roads i will only uh, 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 say that there are some terms i'm going to use and the terms are surface course which is the top layer on the road there are some binding courses on roads which might be there might be one or, or several so here we can see two binding courses here and there is a base or base course and this is what you can see in between the roads and it obviously extends uh, under the road uh, as as well and uh, so what do road engineers do when the surface course wears off because the surface course on roads is where the contact between road wheel and the surface of road occurs so it warns off similar to how our rails warn off so when it warns off too much they do something which is called planning so they use machine like that and they basically scrape the whole of surface cores off you know and then bring a new asphalt concrete mixtures and just rebuild the surface course right the surface course is something like 50 to 70 millimeters and it's designed to function like that so when it's worn off too much it's scraped off or planned off they are calling it planning and it's put on the top top uh, uh, tip lorries and it's tipped you know on a tip like this you know and it's it's really equivalent treatment to our rails you know we have rails they worn off we grind them but when when they are grinded too much we need to replace them so they do that with the surface course so they scrape it off it comes here and then comes onto a tip like this and this thing is called side one asphalt and that obviously brings in a question you know we have you know quite a lot of this side one asphalt what should we do with it because you know uh, we are using roads and the surface course gets worn off it needs to be planned regularly and uh, you know so we are progressively having more and more of this material and the road engineers uh, came up with a solution obviously and they say why don't we just uh, use it again you know and after some considerable research they basically said okay so we take side one asphalt you know from the planning of surface curves and then we can reprocess it which means we, we are going to sort it we are going to crush it again you know do some sieving and we are going to test it and that's really important we are going to test it you know so the crushing and sorting and sieving you can see on a picture in the left and uh, here you can see uh, on the picture on the right you can see some test on the asphalt itself on the binder content of the of of the asphalt and if you do all this <clears throat> then uh, uh, and you you get some uh, knowledge about the properties of that asphalt and then you can have something which is called reclaimed asphalt so philosophy is this you take side one asphalt you take side one asphalt which is actually a waste material and you put some effort energy and care and you turn it into secondary product of known properties it's very important that you actually know what it is and as such it has value right so the process is turning of waste material 
by reprocessing it into a secondary product which can be then used again. And uh, we have standards on testing of side one asphalt and making it a reclaimed asphalt, you know, and in Britain it's this uh, EN 13108 uh, 8, and it defines reclaimed asphalt as a processed side one asphalt suitable and ready to be used as constituent material for asphalt after being tested, assessed and classified according to the standard, right? So the important bit is the tested, assessed and classified. You know, you need to have, you need to be in control that it's actually a secondary material, that you are not using waste. And there is a difference between asphalt waste and reclaimed asphalt. You know, one is a waste and the other is a secondary product and a difference is made by that you actually assess its quality. So that's what's reclaimed asphalt. And what you do with it is that you can use it in another mixtures. Because in mixtures, you use virgin asphalt, but it's made from oil. That's irreplaceable resources. And you use virgin aggregate. But what's virgin aggregate? It's basically a crushed high quality rock. Again, irreplaceable resource. So less you use of those, better you are both economically and in sustainability. So more uh, reclaimed asphalt you can use in the mixture, less you need to use the virgin, better you are basically. <clears throat> yeah, better you are basically. Now, how can we use asphalt concrete within railway track bed? So uh, here, oh, I need to draw into here, this is this is a standard solution. So we have a ballast, we have sub ballast layer and subgrades, and we can use asphalt basically as a replacement for sub ballast layer, or we can use asphalt concrete layer uh, in conjunction with a sub ballast layer or any other track bed layer we we deem suitable. We can have some weird application or like some specific application of asphalt on a track bed. So we can actually have asphalt concrete uh, track bed layer with sleepers. Uh, you know, uh, put directly on it. We can see it on the picture in the uh, uh, top, which is ATD system in Germany and Austria, where sleepers are put uh, like that. And we can also use asphalt concrete as a track bed layer supporting a concrete slab track on a picture here, which is GBM system from Germany and Austria. And it's the system which uh, has been chosen recently to be the uh, dominant track form of HS2 in the UK. But in our research, what I'm describing, we are going to um, describe the, uh, the type C, uh, which, is, which is in the middle. So uh, using asphalt concrete track bed layer with uh, 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 additional track bed layers. So uh, track bed, railway track bed, uh, so asphalt concrete in railway track bed, uh, it has some benefits and we will talk more about those as, as the talk progresses, but it has some drawbacks. And the main drawback is that when you compare it to, uh, you know, doing um, a track bed of blanketing sand or, or cr crushed aggregate or something like that, the demands on quality control throughout all stages of the construction process. So during the design, during uh, procurement, during transport of the mixture from uh, the mixing plant onto the site, during compaction and during uh, uh, cooling of the asphalt concrete are much higher than when compared to a standard solution. However, if you compare it to other types of formation treatment, let's say you would do hydraulically bounded soils, you know, you need to have pretty high uh, standards of quality control as well. So it really depends uh, with uh, what you compare it to. And some timeline, you know, so uh, asphalt concrete and railways and timeline. So um, uh, we are here today. And obviously on roads, asphalt concrete is used since uh, they invented cement made asphalt. So I would say like 1920s and then reclaim asphalt on roads really start in 1970s. And right now we are in position then that on roads we use up to 15% uh, of, of reclaimed asphalt in surface courses, up to 30% on binder courses and up to 50% on base courses. 
and on pavements you know we are actually using or some places use 100 percent reclaim asphalt mixtures and it's called rolled asphalt you know and the reason for that is that uh, obviously pavements they don't have a, a such a, such load so uh, you can you can use 100 percent of reclaimed asphalt what about railways asphalt concrete virgin asphalt concrete on railways we can see 1970s started with japan and italy in 80s usa joined in in 90s germany and austria 2000s france and spain and then everybody else is kind of, you know, getting up to speed uh, right now. In terms of uh, using asphalt concrete with some amount of reclaimed asphalt, as far as we were able to um, to review, uh, there's only two published bits, which is one is in France, when there is a trial site, pretty much like ours, uh, where the mixture contains somewhere between 20 to 30 percent of reclaimed asphalt and then it's us in 2016 so uh, uh, yeah um uh, important thing this uh, this scheme is to the best of our knowledge it is possible that some place somewhere you know did it did something of this but we weren't able to read it because it was in some language unaccessible to us so uh, apologies to everybody we've missed in this diagram you know just to okay so it was a really quick background and now let's go to the real thing which is a case study in a town of Šťáhlavy which is probably unpronounceable for most of you but anyway lovely Czech town of Šťáhlavy and what's the timeline of our research? So uh, it all started with uh, Dr. Kuchera, then a student doing his PhD thesis in, in Czechia. And it was mainly based with small and large scale laboratory testing. And uh, when uh, Dr. Kuchera did his uh, thesis, uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Lidmila was his supervisor. So that's how the two got together. And uh, the testing really went well. It, 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 it really showed promise into using uh, asphalt concrete with high percentages of reclaimed asphalt in it for the railway application. And then they basically went out and tried to tell everybody about these results. And um, Petr Jasansky heard about it and said, OK, well, uh, let's try it. Let's, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's try to, to put this on some in, in some real life situation and then opportunity arrived in 2016 where there was a problem on a section of track in Šťáhlavy and a decision was taken to actually do some kind of formation treatment and uh, Mr. Jasansky stepped in and said uh, why don't we use this asphalt concrete thing why don't we uh, make it a testing site instead of using some other you know, known uh, type of formation treatment. And then he persuaded everybody who needed to be persuaded. And uh, we got all the signatures and sign offs, and that was great. And then uh, we built it between 20th and 23rd of May 2016. And from that date onwards, we are monitoring it to uh, basically learn how it behaves, whether it behaves well or not. So, uh, uh, very briefly, uh, the laboratory investigation, uh, mainly done by uh, uh, Peter. So, Peter started, uh, you know, in a, in a uh, reclaim asphalt processing plant and he took samples like that from a heap here, which is the reclaim asphalt, not the first heap here, which is the which is uh, uh, which is the side one asphalt so he took some samples and then took them into the lab and uh, he did some compressive strength tests and he you know some compressive strength tests and he did some water permeability tests and uh, you know how it isolates and, and stuff like that uh, stuff like that and because it went well he went on to do some large scale uh, laboratory testing. So he, uh, there is a box, a Czech Technical University like that, containing uh, half a sleeper, ha half a sleeper like this. And uh, he tried to simulate a very weak, uh, weak subgrade in it. And here you can see the asphalt concrete layer made of 100% reclaimed asphalt, you know, so as much as you can go. And then uh, there is a piston and we did some cyclic loading and uh, see what it did. 
and it actually worked surprisingly well. So the conclusion of his thesis is that it is possible to create a trackbed layer made of 100% of uh, reclaimed asphalt. You know, as you know, no one has ever done that before, or no one we know about has ever done this before. So, pretty good achievement. The re reclaimed asphalt layer is capable of compensating for extremely weak subgrade. Really, in that model, we try to to you know we used some. Um, some ceramics clay which is absolutely like low strength and still it did not fail so that was pretty good and there was a particle worry that uh, the reclaim asphalt layer will exhibit excessive permanent deformation because uh, there was a worry that the loads are on uh, railways are much higher than on roads and this will cause the the, uh, the layer to basically fail by excessive deformation. But this did not happen, which was great. And the main result really was <clears throat> uh, a table of design properties of a uh, re reclaim asphalt mixture. So if we ever are going to uh, use a reclaim asphalt mixture in railway setting, what are the design properties the mixer should have? So uh, he was able to provide us with that. And he passed his uh, PhD viva with uh, flying colors. So um, kudos to him. And then the trial site at Shahlovi, finally, the real life solution. So some basics, you know. So uh, we have Europe here. Here is the UK. And uh, here is, uh, here is uh, uh, Czech Republic. Here is Czech Republic. Now you can see Czech Republic, uh, you know, more close up. We have capital Prague here, and uh, 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 we have two cities of Plzeň and Česká Budějovice uh, uh, here. And here you can see it on railway map. Uh, there is a, a, a railway line on uh, between Plzeň and Česká Budějovice, and then the little town of Šťáhlavy is uh, represented by the black uh, dot close to the city of Plzeň. You will know České Budějovice because it's internationally known as Budvais, and that's when Budweiser Budvar is from. And I mean the original Budweiser Budvar, not the cheat from USA, right? And you will also know the city of Plzeň because Pilsen is internationally known as Pilsen, and that's where Pilsner Urquell is from. So two uh, uh, world famous lagers, you know, and uh, and the railway line between the two, with the little town of Stahlovy. And uh, in the table we can see some uh, basics about the sign. So we obviously, you know, have the position. The length of the trial site is 74 meters. The maximum axle load on the line is 22.5 tons. And the maximum speed is 100 kilometers per hour, which is 60 miles per hour. And the annual load in 2009 was 10, oh, let me get this right. So it's 10 equivalent million gross tons per annum. Oh, I got through it. Yay. Anyway, all those three, the axle load, the maximum speed and the, the annual tonnage, if such a line was in the UK, it would probably be categorized as a category three uh, uh, line, just for for comparison. And so now you can see uh, you can see uh, the site in order photo map. So uh, you know around this is the town of Stahlavi. The Stahlavi station is to towards the left of the photo, <clears throat> and the trial section really there is a level crossing. In, in 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 the section and the trial section runs just from before the level crossing for 74 meters towards the right here towards Plzeň. <clears throat> and what is the site history? So the, the site is known historically for rapid loss of track geometry. And uh, so several in the, uh, several times in the history there were periods of uh, rapid, ra rapid loss of track geometry and really the underlying issue is the bedrock because the bedrock in the area is uh, is uh, consists of losses loss uh, which is a sedimentary uh, rock and it's very weak and is uh, susceptible to water erosion and frost thaw cycles and because the uh, the the level of soil is, is 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 very shallow and the bedrock comes very close to the surface uh, sometimes the track actually lies on the bedrock 
and because the tra uh, track lies on the bedrock, then the water ingresses in, you know, erodes the bedrock, and the whole cycle of deterioration and repairs and deterioration starts. So the bedrock is at fault here. And you can see here are some nice pictures from 1970s when they try to uh, remediate for it by formation treatment uh, with uh, using a blanketing sand. And uh, I believe this gray thing is a fly ash from a nearby coal power plant. So, uh, you know, historical example of, of uh, uh, formation treatment, I believe, in from 1980s. But it didn't really uh, help much. So what we see here is a, a classical standard deviation plot. So twice a year we've got truck recording vehicles who go through through uh, the site and measure, uh, among others, uh, rail tops. And from rail tops over 200 meters in uh, exactly the same way as uh, we do in the UK, you can calculate standard deviation. Standard, so we have standard deviation here, we have dates uh, on the horizontal axis and uh, you can see that uh, it increases and somewhere around 2014 it actually hits an uh, alert limit and then in less than a half year it breaches through uh, in, what's that? intervention limit and goes to immediate action limit. And at this point, uh, you know, the site was put, uh, uh, there was a temporary street restriction and the site was put uh, in emergency maintenance. So there was excessive tamping and basically they did what they could to keep the line operational. And decision was taken to actually employ, uh, employ some formation treatment. So go there and rebuild the formation from the bottom uh, up. And it took about half a year to plan it, and in the half a year, uh, you know, uh, Mr. Yasansky did all his uh, his persuasion, and decision was taken to actually uh, do uh, asphalt concrete on the site, and uh, the actual uh, site was built, uh, as I said already, between 20th and 23rd of May 2016. You can see the date in the graph uh, shown by vertical line. <clears throat> Let's go. Before we build it, uh, before we build it, we did some plate load tests on site, and you can see that the plate load test uh, uh, actually uh, con confirmed that the subgrade is very weak because uh, because the strength of a subgrade or or the modulus of deformation subgrade was only 16.7 megapascals, which is just barely above minimum standards according uh, above the minimum requirements uh, according to Czech standards so uh, really uh, the formation treatment was justified in this sense and uh, how we did it what we decided to do there actually so we decided to have this uh, compound track bed structure so subgrade is here then we use geograde then we used 150 mil of a uh, crushed aggregate protecting layer and on top of that we used 150 millimeters of asphalt concrete with 70 percent of reclaim asphalt blanket layer and uh, the thing in behind the design was this uh, we decided uh, at the onset that we do not want to use a paver finisher uh, uh, because uh, it's difficult to get on track. I will talk about it later. And because the length is just 74 four meters, you know, it's short section for such a complicating piece of machinery as a paver finisher. So we wanted to build it uh, simple. We just wanted to bring um, the asphalt mixture uh, on the tipping lorries, back tip it onto the side and just uh, compact it using a simple compact layer, you know, uh, uh, um, compacting drummer and so we were thinking so the subgrade is very uh, weak so if it rains you know it won't be able to support the the lorries you know they cannot reverse on there because the subgrade is so weak it's not going to uh, going to support that so we need to create a permanent road for them by you know having at least 150 millimeters of crash ag aggregate layer and because uh, the subgrade also is 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 uh, formed of uh, very fine particles, you know, immediately as we would put this crashed aggregate layer on the subgrade, there would be a pumping of fines happening. So we need to use this uh, this geotextile to separate the two together. 
And once we have the 150 mil, let's keep it there, which will enable us to use 150 millimeters of AC layer instead of, let's say, 200 or 300. And uh, because it will be 150 mils, we, we, we can then compact it in one go. So this was uh, generally the thinking behind the, behind the design when, uh, when we did it. Uh, let's go and this is from construction you know so uh, as we said we did so we have some 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 uh, you know tipping lorries uh, reversing and back tipping the the asphalt mixture on the pre uh, prepared uh, protective layer then we have a, a, a greater spreading spreading the mixture and then we have a simple compacting roller uh, compacting the mixture and uh, the result is pretty good and um, the important information is that compaction temperature was kept between 100 and 120 degrees celsius and after after uh, after the uh, the construction we obviously did some testing so we have a lightweight deflector matter uh, we have a plate load test and we drilled some core samples you know and tested it in the laboratory and let's see what we've achieved. So in the table here, in the first column, these are our design parameters. And in the second column, it's what we actually achieved. So um, grinding, uh, grading and binder content, these are guaranteed by, uh, by the mixture manufacturer. So that was all right. Uh, the important bit is the void ratio and dry density. We aimed for a very low void ratio to basically make the layer as impermeable to water as possible. So uh, our target was less than 4.5% and we were able to achieve 1.9. So tick here. Dry density is also in the interval. And in terms of strength of the actual layer, uh, we wanted to have compressive strength on the drilled sample of more than 2.5 megapascals and we achieved 4.1 between 4.1 and 4.5 so tick here as well one thing we did not achieve was uh, how much reclaimed asphalt we can actually have in the mixture so we wanted to have 100% reclaimed asphalt in the mixture but when we actually go there and ask the suppliers whether they can provide the mixture they were really really surprised because as i said earlier on roads the maximum amount of reclaim asphalt currently used is 70 percent and because this was the first time we did anything uh, substantial with asphalt concrete on railways in czechia none of the suppliers was ready to do the, the railway bids they were only supplying road constructions so they were kind of worried that if they use 100% of reclaim asphalt, they won't be able to guarantee DOs too. So then we found a supplier who said, uh, okay, we will give you 70% of reclaim asphalt and then we can guarantee it too, but not more than that. Um, yeah, so that's how uh, we uh, get to the 70% instead of uh, any other percent if, you, if you're interested. Yeah. And then uh, how how the truck behaved after we've done it. So we see the same graph as we already saw. So we saw the first uh, first part of 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 the graph already. Then we constructed uh, we then we constructed the site, and we can see that after construction, the rate of standard deviation deterioration. Uh, uh, reduced significantly. So if it was 0.6 before, it's 0.3 now. Then somewhere during 2019, there was a tamping going through through the site, as you would expect. The standard deviation decreased, but then the rate resumed practically at the same rate. So before we did formation treatment, it was 0.6. Now it's something like 0.3 basically halving uh, the deterioration in standard deviation, which means we basically uh, doubled the uh, expected uh, service life in the section. So that's truck behavior after the construction. One very interesting thing, if you use the same graph and plot there the network rail limits, 
you know so you can see in the blue these are limits as applied on a uh, Sprava Železnic network so in Czechia you can also apply you know plot network uh, network rail limits into the same graph and what it will show is that while we were all worried here and did all the circus with asphalt concrete here if the same line was uh, was in the UK it would only go from being a good truck onto being a satisfactory truck please do not ask me why this is i have no idea does this mean that we are over engineering in czechia or does that mean that you know uh, network rail doesn't care about rails uh, about their tracks i don't know please do not ask me these questions i genuinely don't know i just find it very interesting and I wasn't able to find out why that is. Anyway, uh, we have some conclusions from the trial site. So our conclusion is that it is possible to construct 70 uh, asphalt concrete track bed layer, include, uh, you know, including 70% of reclaimed asphalt in the mixture with only basic mechanization, and it performs well. This is, I think, kind of significant uh, finding because it proves you can take the paver finisher of the equation and you can still get a pretty good result. Uh, the layer provides more homogeneous truck support uh, and the rate of degradation of standard, uh, uh, standard deviation is basically halved, practically dub doubling the service life expectancy. Also, in railway community, not only in Czechia but elsewhere, there is this uh, this worry about uh, using asphalt concrete uh, causing um, excessive permanent deformation and having troubling uh, troubles with bleeding and rutting and all that kind of stuff. And we record no problems whatsoever since 2016. So either we are lucky, or these problems aren't as bad or you need uh, you know uh, on railways as they are on roads so where do i see ways forward so ways forward there are two ways forward i see first of it is that uh, if you um if you if you plot uh, or, or you, you you distinguish your asphalt mixture based on the temperature required for for compacting you can distinguish between hot asphalt and warm asphalt and half warm asphalt so our mixture with 120 degrees sits in warm asphalt but obviously lower in temperature you can get without compromising the quality of your layer the better for you you are saving energy you know um it's, it's easier to do so one way forward would be can we actually instead of using warm asphalt mixtures can we actually use half warm asphalt or even cold asphalt mixtures while still getting the same quality of a truck bed layer while still getting the same uh, same performance out of it and the second would be to move both uh, 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 reclaim asph asphalt reprocessing and um, heating os uh, on asphalt in situ you know so if we can bring it in as cold and reheat it in some of the machines like that in situ especially for these little pieces of track or even like for if, if you would put it under SNCs or just somewhere where, where there is a under track crossing that would be uh, very beneficial so how are we with the time okay so we have few more minutes so just briefly uh, i will try to discuss uh, what's the relevance of our findings uh, for the UK. So if you look onto the research into railway asphalt concrete in the UK, you will find out there's uh, quite a lot of research actually going on. There's uh, plenty of it. Most notably, a lovely summary of uh, uh, how the asphalt concrete on railways uh, standing is in the UK is provided by you know PWI. So you can go on PWI YouTube channel, and there you will find uh, a talk by Benjamin Lee, who's senior engineer in Network Rail Technical Authority, giving a pretty good summary of what's the state of affair with asphalt concrete in the UK. 
and uh, you know we can do this uh, this uh, uh, little competition of spot difference and if we look on the pictures from all around the world, you know, uh, so that's us, uh, this is the UK, then we will see that all these pictures are the same, you know, uh, here the Austrians do the same type of, 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 of layered uh, truck bed as we did in Czechia, you know, Americans do it on level crossings as well, you know, and the French are using for large stretch, stretches of their high speed rail uh, paver finisher. You can see here the same things they uh, did on the trial site in York in the UK. The only difference in the picture is actually the year when it was built, but it's still the same technology. And that brings us to where, uh, uh, sorry, I'm just going to skip this because we don't have the time. It brings us uh, to where we are at in the UK. So, um, the world is here in 2021 and the trend is clear so you want to use uh, asphalt concrete with as much of a reclaimed asphalt in it as possible you do not necessarily want to use a paver finisher to do it and you also want to have mixture which is specifically designed for railway applications because uh, if you have uh, asphalt concrete in a track bed, you want to get something different out of it than if you have it on the road because it's buried, it's it's deep in the track bed. It's not a surface uh, course of a road. It's actually a track bed layer on a railway. So you can use that to your advantage and you can specify the properties of the mixture as it suits you and not just blindly copy it from roads. So here is, you know, 2020s, that's where the world is. And if you look at where the UK really is, it's where the world was around 2000. And this is probably not surprising because uh, we've just started under UK, but we should be open about that there exists the technology gap where we are now and we, where we would like to be. You know, and the risk really is that if we keep moving at the same pace as the world, in 10 years we will get here, but the world will move on. So uh, we might be staying still 10 to 20 years behind. So my opinion on this is that we should always aim to close the technology gap. Of course, we need to do it on, in controlled manner. Of course, we need to build up our confidence in design, in, uh, in, in procurement, in quality control. We need to build up confidence with our suppliers and also confidence with our contractors. You know, uh, they are not used to working with uh, asphalt concrete the same way as a Czech railway constructors weren't used to work with asphalt concrete on, in railway environment. So it takes time, but we should not keep our eyes off the ball and we should really focus on, you know, uh, progressing towards where uh, the world is right now. And uh, Okay, so uh, the main conclusion from, uh, from, this, uh, from this talk. So, important bit, everything I say is only valid if you have proper quality control in place throughout the project which contains asphalt concrete. But if you manage to do that, then asphalt concrete track bed layer works. And we have 50 plus years of experience to prove it. There's no doubt about it. If you do it properly, it works. It works not only for new high speed, high load tracks, but also as a formation treatment in short sections. It works with up to 100% of reclaim asphalt. Again, if you have proper quality control in place, reclaim asphalt is as good as virgin asphalt concrete. And using road terminology, uh, we are not building a road to build a railway on top of that. We are building one of many track bed layers, which means it has some requirements. We have some requirements on the mixture and on the layer which are different to requirements we have on roads 
and we should use this to our advantage. We should be careful, but we should use this to our advantage. And the final point is that paver finisher is an option, not a necessity. You know, paver finisher, it has some wonderful properties. It reheats, uh, it reheats, it remixes the asphalt concrete mixture before laying it down and spreading. It also reheats it, you know, making sure that the compaction temperature is actually what it's supposed to be. So there's some wonderful properties of paver finisher, but you should treat it as any other machinery, you know. So paver finisher is really good when you do large stretches of, of, of paving, you know. So I'm pretty sure when HS2 are going to build their track form, they will use paver finisher, you know, because they start in London and end up, uh, well, hopefully in Manchester, but right now they end up in, in Birmingham anyway. So paver finisher is good for some, some, some situation, but it's not like, if you cannot use paver finisher, it's game over for, for AC and you should use something else. That's not the case, or at least it wasn't the case in our scenario. And then for UK, okay, let's start small, you know, just in case that we mess it up, uh, we don't cause such a problem. Start small, build up our confidence, but we should really aim to use the top of the technology eventually and that eventually shouldn't be in some distant future, but it should be should be fairly soon. Okay, so these are the references of all the pictures I've stole from the internet, you know, by the numbers. And uh, I would thank you, and uh, I'm open to questions if you have any. Well, thank you very much, Marek. Marek. That was a fascinating presentation. And um, what I will do, because we do have some questions in the chat, is I will call on your name um, if I pick out your question and if you could unmute your microphone and you can go ahead and ask that. If you don't, I will read it out for you. Um, so if we go to Alex Baldwin, would you like to ask your question? Alex? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yeah. Um, my question is specifically around the, the transition with the existing design and looking at a um, question of how did you manage the transition with the existing formation and how did you monitor it? Yeah, so transition, thank you. Great, great, uh, great uh, question. So one of the lessons learned is that uh, if you ask people to do two new things at one, uh, they will be able to do just one. So uh, we asked our uh, our contractor who was working on the uh, on the project to do two new things they never done before. We, one was doing transition, and the second was doing an asphalt concrete track bed layer. And it very soon became clear that we can only have one of those things. So despite our effort to have a the best transition zone in the trial section, there was very little, you know. So, so we designed it, and we designed it similar to what you would do in uh, in, in Britain. But uh, we weren't able to uh, to in that short time between, you know, how it was. It was just half a year, and it was like really we spent one third of of that time, uh, you know, uh, basically. Uh, trying to persuade people that we should do asphalt concrete. We did not manage it. I have a slide here which basically says rail tops and I haven't shown, uh, shown it because uh, there wasn't much time but uh, on the slide you can see so the red dashed line is the last uh, 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 truck recording vehicle before the section was actually uh, before the formation treatment was, was performed, so before the asphalt concrete was built. And then the horizontal line show, show the transition zone. And you can see that in the middle and where the level crossing is, we actually improved the situation, but here towards the end, we worsened the situation. And I think that's the best example you can have uh, what is going to happen when you do not build uh, your transition zone properly. So unfortunately, uh, we do not have a proper transition zone there, but it is very important and you need to do it. Uh, good question, thank you. 
Thank Thanks. you for that. Um, so we'll go to next question. Is it crams, crams? I apologise if I uh, pronounced that wrong. I, I've actually put a couple of potential questions in the chat. Would you like to ask those? Mm. Yeah. Okay. So, so what density? So, so, yeah. What density of asphalt mixture did you use, cap grader or other? Uh, density. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I, I will need to go back uh, to you on that one because uh, because I, I don't know the answer to that one. It will be in the paper, but uh, I, I can I can remember from top of my head. Sorry, sorry. Uh, then other questions from Steve Featherston. Are HS2 considering this four-day ballasted sections? Uh, the answer is I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't know what HS2 are considering this. Uh, and I don't have any details about it. So I've heard that they might, but I really don't know any details about it. What's, what's their mixture going to be? Uh, is it going to be only the asphalt concrete track bed layer or is, are there going to be any other track bed layers? I, I don't know about HS2 much. Sorry. Then we have a question. Uh, yeah, it's all about HS2 uh, and Ravi. What type of track bed formation will HS2 use or are they still considering the option? Uh, same as for, for, for Stephen. Uh, I don't know much about HS2 and their, their, their design, so unless it's publicly available and I can Google it, I don't have any any inside information about it, so, so sorry about that. And there's a question from Krams again. Makes me think if the asphalt layer is not for road building specification, with the vast amount of spoiled ballast, could that material be used for a large mixed aggregate course? Yeah, um, yeah, we, we 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 could potentially looked into it. I would say, uh, like from top of my head on on this one. Okay, yeah. So this is a fair point. You know, we can look on it, and there are there is research. Uh, I could do a review, but I would need to review it to to know what the actual state is. But there exists research when they're basically looking what can we use as a filler both in concrete and in asphalt concrete. You know, is it just a crushed aggregate that works quite well, but is it the only thing? Can we use some waste material, some other waste material? You know, Can we actually use a crushed reclaimed concrete as a filler to asphalt concrete or, 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 or back into concrete as well? Um, what about spoil ballast? Uh, could that material be used for large mixed aggregate costs? About spoil ballast, um, yeah, uh, I would say with spoil ballast, uh, I should, I, I would say that uh, that we should first uh, try to use it as a ballast again. So we should like try to sieve it and uh, what amount of ballast can be used maybe in a uh, you know low grade uh, uh, low category or lower category tracks you know or somewhere in siding and stuff as long as we can use it as ballast we we probably should use it as ballast if uh, we cannot use it as ballast then i think we should uh, crush it and use it as a, as a sub ballast layer you know so if you have a, if 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 it if it's now uh, too round then you can crush it, make it angular again, and use it something like a 0, 016 uh, sub ballast layer. But if you cannot do that, then yes, we should look into it whether we can actually use it in asphalt concrete or in concrete for the matter as well uh, for sustainability. Um, yeah, and then Steve Ferguson reacts that uh, we should consider geopolymers at transition zones that uh, Mohammed Wehbi at Geobar can provide further info. Yes, yes, I know about uh, geopolymers. As I said, the intention was to have the transition zone there because uh, like, we understand uh, the importance of transition zone, but uh, uh, it, it just didn't happen. It just didn't happen. The time was too short and uh, uh, the contractors were uh, mentally ready for it. So uh, yeah, that's that's what it is. It happens sometimes. That's all questions I can see in the chat, Rebecca. Yes, I do believe that's it. Um, so thank you very much for those who asked questions and to yourself, Mark, for, for answering those. 
And um, just to close things up, on behalf of everybody at Birmingham Section and everybody here today, we'd just like to do our vote of thanks. So thank you very much um, for sharing your knowledge and your experience with us this afternoon. Um, and for everybody else, um, again, thank you for coming along. And we will continue with um, next month's meeting with your usual chair, Richard, will be back. So thank you all for coming along and we'll see you next time.